I would like to thank our top sponsors Bergemo, Fergus Ryan, Matthias Preu and Ivan Justen for making this show possible. And welcome to the Cave of Apelles. Did you ever wonder what painterly means? Well, tonight's centerpiece explains it all. The work won the Worldwide Kitsch Competition of 2021 and made its painter my guest for the evening. He teaches at the university in Texas and will share both his teaching experiences as well as the qualities of Dutch genre painters like Adrian Brouwer or even the American cowboy painter Remington. Studying with Odd Nerdrum, he will also break down the most important things he is currently learning. Sean Roberts, welcome to the Cable of Police. Thanks for having me here, Jan Ove. But it wasn't given that you should come here <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> with your travel. It was, it was you quite the struggle. You uh, have to tell that story. Yeah, I, I think it was perhaps like the hero's journey. <laughs> so uh, the day before my journey here, uh, I look online and have a, a notification that my flight was canceled. Jeez. And I was like, oh, crap, what am I going to do? And then it showed that they changed it to, to that I was going to fly out of Washington, D.C. And I live in Texas, so that's... That's like a two-day drive. That's quite the journey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I panicked. I was on the phone, and I finally got, got my flight fixed, but I was going to fly out of, uh, of uh, Houston on three different airlines, and there was one-hour layover in between each flight. Oh, okay. um, my first flight, I flew to Washington, D.C., and it's a huge airport. We arrived like 30 to 45 minutes late. And I have, uh, I have these, these big boots on. I've got this huge cowboy hat because I have to represent Texas, you know. Um, also, uh, my backpack is full of books, uh, one of them being Odd Nerdrum's Themes, which is very thick. I, I would estimate maybe 70 to 80 pounds in my backpack. Um, so imagine that uh, running across the airport fast as I can. I, you know, mothers were moving children out of the way. And I looked like a, a crazy maniac for real. And uh, I had to catch a train. I had to, to and I had to, I kept stopping like, I can't breathe. Uh, but I kept run, trying to run, run again. I was like, I'm so out of shape. I don't know what I'm going <laughs> to. I finally made, made it to the desk when they were about to close the, the, the gate. Yeah. Um, and and I was like out of breath, like, wait, 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 the, 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 you know, stumbling around. And, and I just, I, I, I was like, I'm on this flight. To, here's my confirmation number. I don't have a boarding pass. And yeah. they're like, calm down, calm down. <laughs> and they, they, they printed me out a, a, a pass. And, and I was the last person on before yeah. they, they closed the gate. And, oh, yeah. I, and I was, uh, you know, with all this traveling and everything, um, I was coughing a lot, so I was yeah. like, I was telling everybody, I promise I don't have COVID. It's yeah. just I, I had to run. I had yeah. to run. I, I felt like pieces of my my throat were coming up. Oh, with, yeah. uh, it, it was it was rough, but then I was like, okay, I made it. I made it. <laughs> <laughs> I relaxed. I was sweating, and um, and then I I enjoyed the rest of the flight. And then I arrived here, and I go to to pick up my luggage. And mind you, I have my canvas, my paint, my brushes, all of my clothes, my chargers, everything, everything I need. And the last piece of luggage is picked up and mine hasn't come out. And I was like, holy crap, what am I going to do here? <laughs> uh, what is going to happen? Um, so I went to the counter and, and I told them and, and they told me that, you know, you, you can follow a report. And, and I was thinking, oh, typical, I'm probably going to never see this stuff again, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I, I go to the to take the train and, and, and come here all very depressed. And and I'm I'm watching people paint for, you know, almost a week. And I think, what am I going to I'm going to have to just spend a lot of money or, or something, you know. Uh, but finally, you know, I get a call and my luggage arrives and I take all that pent up energy and just throw it into my painting. So, yeah, you've been yeah. working quite a lot uh, uh, since you came here. Yeah, yeah. It, it's wow. it's it's been uh, it's been good. You know, I, I think it's good. You have that struggle and then you, you obtain the knowledge and then you yeah. bring it back to your people. So, you know, it, it's sort of like uh, Joseph Campbell, you know, yeah, yeah. so. 
So there's at least two morals to the story. Don't trust the omens, saying you won't make it. Yeah, yeah. And the other one is don't bring a, bring a big Northern book when there's plenty of Northern books here. Exactly. Where I, you go? I get here, there's three of those on the <laughs> shelf already. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> but you made it. I made it. You made it. And then I go up and they're like, oh, okay, well, we'll show you your room. And and then I, and I, I wasn't expecting this. They're like, okay, now uh, come in and, and meet Odd. And uh, you know, I walk in all exhausted and, and he's just sitting there and I'm surrounded by his paintings. And I've, I've only seen them in the books at this point. So I'm, I'm totally shocked and, and speechless. And then, and then the man is sitting there and he shakes my hand and he's like, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm a big fan of yours. And I'm, so, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm speechless. I'm like, uh, I'm a big fan of yours too. And I have to sit down because my knees are wobbling and, and I, I think, uh, you know, I'm embarrassed. I'm almost going to cry. <laughs> And he's like, sit down, it's okay, calm down, calm down. <laughs> and, and then there's the beginning of our, our first morning meeting. Yeah. And yeah, so that was a, a great sort of beginning. That's perfect. I mean, I really want to get towards the end to hearing what your experiences are when it comes yeah, to yeah. what you've learned here and what you are learning here. Um, but I think we should just devote quite a bit of time to the centerpiece here because this is the masterpiece that won the Worldwide Kitsch competition in 2021. Yes, Made thank by you. you, sir. Yes. So what can you say how well, about how working with it? Because, I mean... It was a struggle. Spoiler alert, you're a very painterly painter. So <laughs> uh, let's get in yeah, let's and some, some of the secrets. Well, the secret is don't have a formula. It, it always goes to hell and you have to just try to, to, to save it and keep bringing it back. So it's almost like you take three steps forward, two steps back, one step forward, three steps back. You know, you sand it, you paint it, you sand it, you paint it, you wipe it with a rag, you screw it up, you scrape the face out, you move it, the nose goes up, your head tilts more, and eventually, the more times you've scraped it out and painted it and brought it back, you somehow sort of embody the figure with a breath, a life, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not just like a one and done. Yeah, that, that is so weird. When you start sanding down, I mean, uh, Notre has compared it to a movie going inwards. The, the, the pictures are not after each other, but inwards in space. Yeah, right? So yeah. you have, have this movie going inwards. And when this starts to, to uh, work together, then you get that sort of air yeah. into it. Yeah, and that, it's great when that starts to emerge and come forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but you, I mean, you had some kind of an idea... I mean, you have ships in the background here, yeah. standing on by railing, and you had yeah. that idea from the beginning? Or? Well, a lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll do a lot of sketches, and, and I'll have an idea going in, and sometimes that works, and sometimes it goes to hell, and and then I see that it's not working, and the story changes as, I'm, as I make the painting. And sometimes... Um, you know, sometimes I start a portrait and the story develops. I don't have anything I'm starting with. But with this one, I had an, an idea of where I was going, uh, but the story totally changed. Um, okay, so what, what was the initial idea? Initially, I was influenced by reading the, the book Parsifal, uh, about sort of the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. search for the, the Grail Stone. And, and I, reading that, I knew I wanted to, to do a portrait of sort of this, this sailor on a journey, um, and, and then the hand originally was going to be the grail stone. Um, which is now a... A messenger pigeon. Yeah. yeah a bird. Yeah. Um, you know, as I was making the, the portrait, uh, I realized that's, that's not universal enough. A lot of people, if they haven't read that book, or they're just going to like, what the heck is this? What's, why is he holding a rock? Mm. Um, so that's another reason it's good to have another pair of eyes to look at your work to look at the painting because you become sort of blind to your ideas and you understand it, but not necessarily everyone's going to, to understand that, you know, someone may look at your painting like, what is that? Is that a rock? Why is he holding a rock? What? And it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So um, one of my colleagues noticed that and he's like, how, how not maybe a bird? And then I thought, yeah, a bird. And then maybe a, a message on its, on its, uh, its leg, you know, like a messenger pigeon, and that will make sense with the scene in the background. 
So you think about the realistic connection between the figure and the surroundings. Right? Exactly. Yeah, and also, um, you know, I've been attending the, the Cave of Apelli Critique Nights, uh, and, and that's been very helpful. In fact, you, sir, have helped me make this painting a better painting. Oh, um, I'll send you my account number. You just <laughs> transfer whatever money you, you wish. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, you might be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I remember that from, uh, you, you sent it in a couple of times. So, so yeah. Yeah, it yeah. changed quite a bit. Uh, in, the, in the beginning, the rail in the back was quite straight. And yeah, this is what we see here. And yeah, and, and the arm was a little flatter, and and you know I had a few suggestions. Like one was to maybe tilt the railing so it distorts the perspective, and then all of a sudden, even though the figure is straight, it feels unsteady, like yeah. he's unstable. Like yeah, the whole boat that we don't really see is exactly. It's a suggestion down. of the boat, and now yeah. you believe it more. Yeah, yeah. Right. but there was something about the. There was something about the color or the, the, the like the shirt he's wearing, wasn't it? Yeah, um, I remember it was just a little too intense green. I think that's, that's what, it, what was. it was. Yeah, so, so when it I took attention, the color was too yeah. present. Yeah. So then what I started to do yeah. is to, when I paint the shirt, I would bring some of the colors of the shirt into the skin. And then when I would paint the skin, I would bring it into the shirt and yeah. then the reflected light from the back, the warm fire, I would try to bring that into the shirt. Like hair. Yeah. yeah. Or, or even or hair. Or in the hair. In a way to try to, to, yeah. to do this with the painting rather than yeah. this. Yeah. And, and, and to integrate, you know. These different surfaces are yeah. in family with each other in terms of yeah. color. And Almost like a dream. You know, when you, you have a dream and you think about, you remember it, you don't necessarily remember what, color shirt the, the the guy had you remember like what action happened so i want the that's a nice image yeah i want the uh or the nice viewer to be yeah. you know gripped by the drama of the figure i don't want it like a bright red shirt or a bright green shirt and you know it's mm. almost like you don't even remember what color the shirt was mm. you know mm. in a way um yeah. yeah but so in what other ways did it change or change the story? The, the, how did the story, story change with those changes? Yeah, well, you know, um, I would say um, in the beginning, the, the arm was very flat. I, 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 I made this way darker and grayer, maybe more gray. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that brought such a drama to the, the hand. And I started thinking about how to play with that. Um, and I started thinking if the sailor was uh, out to sea or or a soldier possibly wounded, uh, you know, perhaps he hasn't shaved or he hasn't cut his hair. So I extended the hair and sort of worked with that even a little bit from imagination because yeah. obviously my hair is not that long. And then I thought, you know, he needs to, to be wounded in a way. And I wanted to focus on the expression in one of the eyes. So I, I just sort of covered covered that eye. And, you know, with the, uh, I work from a combination of three ways. Uh, direct observation from nature, and my imagination, and also looking at paintings, old masters. Uh, so obviously, you know, where I live, I couldn't go and see a burning ship in the sea, right? <laughs> so I would look at several painters and several paintings of, of seas and, and ships and, and sort of, uh, combine that with my imagination and try to bring some of those elements and then um, find a way to integrate it with the the idea of how the lighting is going to be and and to make the figure um, feel like it actually exists in that space not just some boring figure lit in front of a curtain or a background exactly you know? because that that's the problem if, if there's a backdrop yeah. behind the figure and there's no connection yeah 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 uh, that's uh, so you have one thing is to connect the figure to the surroundings through the elements i mean the like what you mentioned with the railing yeah so that it's off balanced and as are the ships mm -hmm. but then there's a connection in terms of color too yeah that the different areas reflect yeah. each other or you have one in one of them yeah one area in 
another area in yeah. Terms, yeah, when it comes to the color. Yeah, in that sense, I think sometimes the painting works better whenever you you take from nature, but you're not a slave to it. Mm. You you make changes to make the painting feel more believable, to mm. enhance the drama. Mm. You know, like bringing the colors together in a strange way or uh, scraping through and making an area very blurry so that you focus on another area to sort of almost like a director or a composer you know you're trying to to lead the viewer through the picture yeah yeah and in my experience it's you come to a point where well things are placed correctly uh, all these things are in in order but then it's a matter of getting rid of competition, toning things down. Yeah. Mostly that, yeah. in my experience at least, that to tone things down, pacify things so they don't compete with what should be the main focus. Yeah. You but have then you to, need to know what that is. Holistically, right? What? Holistically. Yeah. 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 Right. That's the thing about uh, um, that old uh, nerd must have been talking about adding the sketch in the end. Yeah, <laughs> right. Titian, right? Yeah, 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 right. Perfect. I mean, it's. Uh, I think that is really something to learn from when I look at this. Uh, I think a perfect example is what you're doing, for example, here, this contrast mm. here, or even this subtle contrast here, where it's almost just warm, cool, but it's almost the same, almost the same yeah. value. Yeah, and you can trust that that keeps the sh the, the, the shape in place. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, and then I shipped this painting here and restretched it, and you know I was I was very nervous when Odd Nerdrum was going to look at it. Um, but he told me he said that he was totally shocked when he saw this painting. He said that it was so loose, but it's not loose. Right. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Well, That's a feat. They, yeah. 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 Um, so, and, and then um, he really liked the way the, the cloud and everything was so circular and just kind of kept you in the picture. Yeah. 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 It's that being able to lead one thing into the other. Yeah. So you don't yeah. see things as, as totally separate. Yeah. yeah. And then he said, congratulations, you made a masterpiece. And I was thinking, never in my life would I think I would hear Odd Nerdrum tell me I made a masterpiece. <laughs> 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 Stop painting now and just go home. <laughs> you can rest <laughs> before, on your, you, before you change his mind, right? <laughs> yeah, you can rest on your laurels for the rest of your yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, that's great. But it, it, tell me something about how, what you did before you came here. I mean, your education, or like your yeah. Um, I actually started painting quite late. Uh, I I didn't really draw or sketch or anything until I was uh, a senior in high school. Okay. Uh, which is strange. I, I'd always been very attracted to, you know, quote unquote artists or, you know, people who could draw. Um, mm. And and I was very intrigued when someone like had the ability to, to like draw a person or a face. And, and I, for some reason, I don't know why, but I thought to myself that that's something that it's a, it's a talent. You have it or you don't. It's, mm. it's something like, you, if you can't do it, then you can't do it, you know. And, and you hear all people always saying, "Oh, I, I can, I can't draw a stick figure, or, or I can only draw a stick figure." And so I guess I was into that camp, and and I didn't realize that it, it was a skill that you could develop, um, just like anything else. And I was uh, sort of um, on the wayward side. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I was just interested in skateboarding at the time. I, I didn't really have any. Uh, so you you were fit. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, I actually had this tattoo of a a red dragon. Oh yeah. Yeah, and it goes all the way down my arm. That was actually a birthday present from my dad. On <laughs> Texan uh, dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? I don't regret it because people ask me all the time, "Do you? Don't you regret that?" You know, and I'm, no, actually, because it changed my life. Uh, and I don't know. Maybe I would have started painting, but maybe not. Um, I remember toward the end of my senior year of high school, I uh, I was bored. We weren't doing anything in class, so I started looking at the the head of the dragon, and I started just trying to replicate it and draw it. And it was just out of boredom. But then I started thinking, wow. It actually kind of looks like it, you know? <laughs> You're and, able to do it. Yeah, and, and, and I, 
I, I don't know what happened. I just become totally obsessed with drawing. Like, uh, I, I got a sketchbook from like the local little Hobby Lobby store and um, I started yeah, trying to- Can I just pause for a moment and second? Seriously, I'm getting goosebumps when you're saying that because it never ceases to amaze me that people are not born into some huge tradition, but suddenly they just start doing this. It's magic. Yeah. I, I, but I, sorry, I, I, I'm yeah. so grateful. Yeah. Like, I, I, it's almost random. I don't know. It's random, but it's not. It's weird. Yeah. Um, and so then, you, draw, you draw the dragon and you discover yeah. you're a genius? And <laughs> yep. And, and I was <laughs> like, oh, what else can I draw? And, and then I, yeah. I, I started drawing stuff. And then my dad saw that I was taking an interest. In, and then he, he went and bought me a, um, just like a, lo a little book on how to draw portraits, you know? Yeah. It, and it, it, was, uh, it was sort of a how to draw from photo book and, and stuff. But I started trying to, to do that. And I would take all the... The family photos and and stuff and 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 then I started trying to draw my own hand from observation, and before I knew it, like the whole summer had passed and I hadn't even went to the skate park. And all my friends were like, "What are you doing? Why aren't you coming?" <laughs> and um, I showed them my sketchbook, and they were like, "Oh yeah, I, I really respect what you're doing and understand now." Awesome. And so, um, and then there was this one one evening. It's happened to me a few times, but it was almost magical because I was drawing this uh, portrait of my sister um, and I felt like I was in my room for like two hours, three hours. And I remember seeing the sun come up in my window mm. and I was like, what the heck happened? How did, <laughs> you know? Um, so some of my counselors uh, from school, they, um, they talked to me to go visit the, the local university, uh, Stephen F. Austin, where I currently teach now. Um, and I saw that they had um, figure drawing classes and, uh, you know, they had painting classes. And I really wanted to learn how to paint. Uh, so before that, I'd only exper experimented once with oil paint and it was a disaster. <laughs> uh, I did not know what I was doing. I, I used a bunch of... Uh, I'll not tell uh, you about my first painting experience. Uh, <laughs> oh, I made a mess. I, I used a, a, a ton of, uh, of uh, odorless uh, mineral spirits or, or turpentine yeah. and the paint just ran every, <laughs> everywhere. And, and I went and tried to clean the brushes out in the bathtub. <laughs> it, 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 oh my 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 step mom was so furious because <laughs> there was like stains of paint everywhere uh so uh i didn't really paint again until i left home and, and went to the the university um but yeah it, it was a good experience actually because there was um uh there were several professors that sort of passed through that that actually painted in a similar way that I saw myself going and they showed me, they kind of guided me on a path to... Uh, and like what direction was that? Uh, well, to work from observation. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. storytelling. Uh, this uh, professor that was uh, sort of passing through, he actually showed me Odd Nerdrum and, and I was like, oh, when did he live? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, he's, he's, he's still alive. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I had, um, I think the, even though a lot of the uh, the professors that were there, they, they didn't work in the same methods that I, I was, you know, in the classical figurative. They saw that I was very ambitious and passionate and I was one of the only students that was coming after hours to work. And so, so they were very supportive of me and, and encouraged me to, to go to a graduate school to, to, to learn even more. And so then I went to the University of Washington and received my MFA there, and uh, honestly, it was a it was a, a great experience. The um, our studios were in an abandoned naval base, yeah, off campus. It was, right. it was pretty cool next to this huge like lake, um, and there was it was a, a bigger university. There was uh, six painting professors, and so painting was its own department within the the college of. Uh, arts and um, we had our own curricula and then we had our own painting seminar class that we would go to and there was also seminars for like all the other areas that you could go to and uh, I didn't really go to those because I visited one and it was so 
intense on sort of uh, critical theory about like, uh, it wasn't an attack on classical figurative painting. It was more of an attack on painting. As such. Like why paint at yeah. all? Yeah. Uh, so I stuck with the painters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know. So there, there was definitely the, that. The painters that we know were all from pretty before. traditional, yeah. Yeah, but, but yeah, so there was definitely that strain of so-called critical thinking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then there was uh, painters that were seriously, seriously yeah. classical, figurative and... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there was a, a big... I mean, you didn't go variety. to class and they tried to break you down and, and stop you from painting. No, right. no. Nope. So that's also... That, that, that's it was awesome. great. You know, like I, I was mainly in the studio and then I would have so many art history classes that I had to take mm. and then so many studio electives and I could choose whatever I wanted. So I took a Baroque art history class and I took um, some figure drawing and figure painting classes mm. and, uh, you know, worked with different professors that that were actually pretty known in the field and, and yeah, I got some good advice. Some yeah. guest professors also? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah, we had guest uh, lecturers, guest artists that would come in and critique our work. Mm. Um, most of the, you know, I got pretty good critiques, but um, <laughs> uh, I used to, um, okay, so let me give you a little backstory. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever I was around nine or 10 years old, I went to live with my father and he was a magician. And so we would travel around all of the southern U.S. and do magic shows at sort of job cores and traveling carnivals and all these kind of places. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, so I, I, my, my part in that was uh, I got paid a little bit to help uh, build some of the illusions and to uh, construct and set up the stage set and deconstruct it and take it to the next venue. And so... I started working. This is starting to sound like some movie. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I was sort of influenced by dramatic, like like movies and stuff as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, the point being is, I was working from observation, and I was doing these uh, large scale self portraits, uh, sort of as these different characters. But I would build and construct my own sort of stage set to look in the mirror to sort of make it authentic mm -hmm. uh, for for what I wanted to do, but. And I, I remember this one uh, visiting artist came in, and they didn't want to, They didn't talk about my paintings. They only talked about the the set that I built for the paintings. You know, they're, they're like, "This is what you should show. This is this is the art." Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Well, you know, maybe that would be interesting next to the painting, but you know, that that's just you know, that's just Props, to get to uh, this. This yeah. is what I want to talk about here." Yeah. yeah. But but uh, that, that that was not a figurative painter or. No. Oh, okay. No, no. Oh, figures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was all in all a, a great experience. Um, so, and then you know I graduated and I, I came back to to where I'm from uh, for the summer and I already had some teaching um, positions aligned that I was going to come back to Seattle and teach at the Gage Academy of Art, which is more of like an atelier type okay, uh, yeah. place. Um, but as I was in visiting, I, I visited the university that I originally went to undergrad and got my BFA. And uh, one of the, the drawing professors was out and was retiring and they needed someone to fill some, some classes. So I thought, man, this is a perfect opportunity. They asked if I wanted to teach some classes and I can, you know, come back to to my family and where I'm from and save a lot of money. Perfect. Uh, so I started teaching there and then um, say a year or so goes by and the, the painting professor there retires and I uh, apply for the position and I get it. And I've been there for 10 years now. 10 years. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's, so it's, tell us about great. that. How is that? I mean, you've being a student, you go more or less directly over to teaching yourself. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a few people who are still there that were teaching whenever I was a student, but a lot of them have retired, and there's there's mm. new people that have coming in. You know, the overturn. Um, but it's a it's a pretty small university, like thirteen thousand or so, and I think our department has between two or three hundred in in the the fine arts. Okay. Um, so I have around 20 painting 
people who emphasize, they're, they're BFA or BA majors, but then they choose an area of concentration and a second area of concentration. Okay. And so I have about 20 that are painting. And um, so usually in each area, there's like a professor. So there's the drawing professor, there's the painting, there's the photography, printmaking. But um, sometimes I might teach a drawing class and some paintings and another teacher teaches in another area and we kind of just rotate around whatever we want to do. Um, so it's a, it's a very uh, sort of small, tight-knit, and, and we all get along pretty well. And I think what's good about it is um, we all bring something else to the t something different to the table that we can um, help the students to, mm. to you know, uh, become better and, and achieve their goals of what they want. And what I bring is I, I can really teach someone the handcraft. Right. Yeah. But, but how, so how do you do it? You have... You make your own. Uh, you decide what the project shall be, or is it yeah. given from the st from the university? Or no, like? we have we have our um, we have sort of. Uh, that's what's great about our boss. He he trusts us with our education to to teach the course how we see fit. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're in a bigger area, say drawing, that one it sort of serves every area because. You, there's required classes that even if you're a filmmaking major, you have to take these drawing classes. Um, so in those courses, maybe there's like a criteria if you have to teach how to do proportions. You have to teach gesture. You have to teach negative space. You have to teach uh, you know how to do value shading. But how you teach that is sort of up to you. Mm -hmm. You know, you you have your own projects what you want to do. Um, but painting. Um, it, it's small. Usually we do two to three classes a semester. And I have um, an intro painting class. I have a figure painting class and then an advanced painting class. And students can retake the advanced painting class or the figure painting class uh, up to three times each. Um, so they can really work long term with, with yeah. the pro Yeah. What it, and, what it, um, yeah. you know, in, in the intro class, I'm really... I'm really concentrated on teaching them a skill set. Uh, a lot of the students coming in for that class, they have never painted before or used oil paint, you know, because that a lot of times is not only painting majors, but people taking it as an elective. Um, so I start out with like a monochromatic still life uh, so that they can just get used to um, how to use the materials. Handling paint without thinking about the color. And yeah, the so it, it's addition. a good transition from drawing yeah. to painting. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I, I introduce the Apelli's palette, uh, have them do a still life, show them how you can get something to look very blue with just black and white mixed mm. to like an orange and talk about relative color and, um, you know, show them. Simultaneous the, contrast. Yeah, yeah, all that. And then we do, uh, I give them like a list of, painters that they can choose from to, to do a, uh, a master copy of a portrait. Okay. Yeah. And then directly from that, we go to self-portraits from the mirror. This is still the intro class. Intro class. Okay. Yeah. And then after that, it's very intense. And after that, the last assignment, I actually kind of open it up. So with the skills they've learned, now they can sort of choose to paint something they're very interested in whether it's a portrait, uh, an, another uh, still life, a landscape, or something more uh, modernist or, you know, whatever they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I, I tell them they have to sort of give me a proposal and take responsibility that it's going to be something that they invest some time and energy, you know, that they mm -hmm. really want to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's good. You know, even the students who choose to, to go in a more... Uh, abstract or modernist way uh, they they're very thoughtful I think they the the skills they've learned helped them to help them to to paint better no matter what their interests are and I think they have an appreciation for uh, the classic as well you know they, they they've seen sort of both sides of things yeah it generally helps when you get to know people or get to, get to know things to not 
yeah. have prejudices against it. Right. right, and a lot of my students, are they find themselves somewhere in the middle, somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know... Yeah, um, so, so how do you do that when you have students who are clearly wanted to paint something that is so-called more modern or more... Yeah. Well, you know, actually, how do you guide with, the, guide with, with my education, I actually have skills and experience critiquing uh, all types of work. Yeah. Um, and so what I do is I really talk to the student and try to find out where they're coming from and what to dig deeper what their interests are and their influences sort of maybe inside painting or art or outside of that, like other things. And then I try to think about maybe people that they can look at and give them suggestions of uh, artists or painters to, to go find in the, like the library and uh, sort of like a starting point for the research and then how to dig deeper. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it's the same way as if someone is interested in painting uh, storytelling, you know, I right. tell them to go get some books on Caravaggio, Rembrandt and, you know, read uh, Aristotle, you know. Um, yeah. And then in the figure painting class, we, we have models and we work from life and we do a lot but of... how do you set that up then? Do you just have a model standing there or do you try to make some kind of narrative out of it or some kind of... I try to get creative. Uh, yeah. So maybe the first one, I, I do some faster stuff just to get them used to, you know, very yeah. simple poses. Yeah. And then I'll set something up very elaborate and, mm. and maybe several weeks uh, uh, to work on. And then I also, you know, I do demonstrations and I talk about how like, okay, well, you know, even though the model's like this and we have this going on, what if you look at this painting and then you can even bring something from the, you change the background, work a little bit from imagination and bring that color into the figure. But that's more sort of the advanced students after they've yeah. uh, painted for a while. You know, a lot of them, they just want to focus on how to paint the, the figure, you know, uh, from More than enough in the, in the beginning. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot. But, you know, that class, a lot of people have, they retake it several times. Mm. So, um try to keep it interesting for students who have had it as well. And then toward the, toward the end, you know, they, they, it's similar to the intro class. They tried to sort of uh, paint something that they're interested in, but using sort of the criteria of a figure, you mm. know. And then I have advanced painting class, which is more of that end stage throughout the whole class, you know. They, they work on what they're interested in, their research, and sort of to put together a body of work of paintings throughout the semester based on their ideas. Okay, so then they, they basically research. choose their own motifs, on yeah, yeah. size, yeah, with, whatever. Yeah, with, with consultation to me, right? Yeah. I'm not going to let someone do five paintings this, this big that takes them <laughs> two seconds. You know, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. It has to be ambitious and they have to be working. Mm. So maybe someone that does really fast work, they need to do more paintings or they need to, you know, you know, it, it's case by case basis. Mm, mm, yeah. Mm. So you, but do you then? Well, again, you I, you have to do uh, adjust it according to the student. Mm -hmm. Say you can do try to do more narrative. You're more of a modernist guy. You look at this, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and especially in the advanced class, because uh, a lot of the students there's. They're thinking about what they're going to do when they leave and possibly uh, applying to graduate schools. So mm -hmm. I tried to help them put together uh, maybe at least a sort of cohesive body of work that doesn't look like just classroom exercises. Yeah, so so they get used to thinking that they, they actually have a job. Yeah. Which is to make paintings that can sell so they can get some money. Yeah. 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 So it's not all about just making a painting and not thinking about the practicalities of your economy and all of these things. Yeah. Hmm. No, that, because I think that's, that's quite important to, to, to learn that this is, yeah, it is a job as well. Yeah. <laughs> you can, yeah. You and can that's, survive. that's why it's, you know, I, I emphasize that there's, I have a, a lock box on the door where they can put a code in and uh, get the key and come in and work after hours mm. as much as they want. And mm. I try to stress like, it's not enough just to paint during the class time. You need to come in and, and work on your painting, you know, at night, on the weekends. Uh, is it, it is a full-time job, you mm. know. You're, mm. You need to, you know, you're paying money for this. You're devoting 
uh, resources to a, tr a trade, your trait, you know, mm. I mean, what, what your career is going to be. So you, you need to be the best you can. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But so the, the university that, what's the name of the university again? Stephen F. Austin State University, Stephen F. Austin. or you can say SFA. SFA. So they are supportive of what you're doing. It's oh yeah. It's not a problem. No. Working there. Yeah, that's so fantastic to hear. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. Uh, we have uh, colleagues. I have colleagues that that do all sorts of different things, and I, I haven't had any kind of uh, aggressive or, or negative uh, response to my work. I, I think they appreciate what I do, and it's great to to have that yeah, support. I mean, yeah. My background is that when they want to have this. Um, line or what you call it like a department for classical figurative painting at the academy in, in uh, oslo norway there was a huge huge uproar that's so crazy that. yeah the the principal told me he was um i'll not go into detail but he was um, not exactly respected he was even attacked uh, by some students and it was it got uh, pretty bad wow so and i that's why i tried to that's like, that's why I keep asking you. So they're not negative because yeah. it's, maybe it's just my brain brain damage. But it's really important to to get the message out that this there are are actually universities or yeah. uh, institutions where these are things are done yeah. and uh, it's respected or at least given the space. Yeah, and you know I can't speak the to like that it's that way all over the U.S. or all over mm -hmm. Texas. But I, th from my experience, I've I've had positive. So. That, that's wonderful. Yeah, but how is the like the general? Well, we have to use the A word, art scene, uh, in, well, in Texas or what? You, you know, there's there's a lot of art scenes in Texas. Texas is big. There's yeah. there's Houston, there's Dallas, uh, there's um, San Antonio, Austin. I know a little bit more about Dallas because that's where my gallery is. Mm. That's that's where I show, and uh, from my experience, um, you know, my gallery shows all types of of artists and um, I was invited to be part of one of their group exhibitions and I was just like mm. I just send the, the director a, a, an email and said well if you ever need another artist or, or to fill your you know your stable or whatever you know mm -hmm. I would be happy to have some exhibitions there and and he replied, "Oh, it would it would be our honor to represent you. And take some photos and send us your your you know work to put on our website." Yeah. And you know, I, I've I have an exhibition coming up there, I believe, uh, in the coming spring, uh, solo exhibition. Twenty twenty three. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I I was a little worried, like oh, these you know I make large paintings, uh, are they gonna sell? You know, and. He told me, look, I realize and understand that your work is a bit different. It's going to take a true collector to, to buy your work, not the everyday person's going to put it on their wall for decorations. Mm. Um, he said, you know, don't worry about compromising the scale or the content, that I'm more interested in having a great exhibition rather than selling your paintings. So I thought, I was like, wow, you know, you hear these horror stories about people in their galleries, but... I, I, I'm not sure, you know, as a whole, but my experience, you know, it's very supportive. It, it's, yeah. it's, it was great. Yeah. Yeah. But is, is there any kind of, um, like, is there like a state budget for culture in Texas or how, how does no, that work? No, we're not really sponsored by government as, as it, that I know of. Yeah. It's more of like private institutions yeah. that, that sort of have, um, Things you can apply for, yeah. It's, yeah. So it's not like through the government. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome because I. Well, let me test test my theory. It, it doesn't that lead to a situation where you have more variety? This uh, so-called variety that everyone wants these days. I think uh, so. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, because I presume that that in that situation, it's not like only classical figurative painters get money. You know, yeah. I mean, there's plenty of, I, mean, I guess, what we yeah. know as, uh, you know, uh, accepted art is f all over the place in, in Texas, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I, th awesome. I think I've been pretty lucky in my experiences yeah. and, and career-wise. Yeah. So there, there's, there's actually a possibility of 
show yeah. him there and, and yeah um, my wife works uh with the the figure and does story paintings and she also has a a great gallery and has had uh success selling paintings and and hasn't had any any problems so you know she's extremely talented though you yeah. too, as well yeah that's awesome but hey, we forgot to talk about one thing, the Worldwide Kitsch competition. Yes. Sort of sliding from the general art scene to the kitsch scene. Yeah. So do you have anything to say about that? Like how, yeah, how is that? I, I think it's a great, uh, great thing. Um, you know, the, my experience in competitions, uh, to compare sort of this type of competition to just a regular, um, I apply to a lot of like, um, uh, group exhibitions or online competitions and then if you get in maybe you send your work and then they you know first second third place uh, but a lot of times at those competitions the work is so different from each other it's like pineapples with grapefruits and mm. you know it's so subjective the criteria and it, it depends on the taste of the juror and, okay, and, so and there's all not these a specific direction yeah on the type of work they want yeah, yeah. and what I, I like about the worldwide kitsch competition is I'm competing against people that are specifically in the field that I am in a sort of exactly. storytelling and and there's objective criteria and so it's it's really amazing and you know looking at I I was honored to even get in the the ex the competition um and to be a finalist and uh, a lot of the the painters that, I, that that were there that I competed against, I really admire and respect their work, and so it was great just to be part of that. But to to win it, it was it was such an honor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so uh, yeah, because it, there's a clear basis on, or focus on storytelling. Yeah, and not just getting the figure correct and all these things. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. You know the the figure has to. Be solid enough to where you believe the story. Yeah, yeah. But the but story needs to be as important. Well, that, that's the, the, what you said. That was so uh, fascinating to hear. Thinking about how, well, like like the railing or like the reflection of the of the burning ships to create that connection between the figure and the background, so you get one mm -hmm. unified image. Yeah. yeah, and another thing with that is a lot of times you may paint, some, paint something that you're in love with and you think, oh man, I painted that so well, but it doesn't serve the story, so it yes. has to go. That's... You have to be willing to sand it out and take it away. Mm. So, so is that kind of what you're saying when you're saying you, you shouldn't have a, what did you say? You shouldn't have a, um, Ask, I asked you in the beginning, like, how, how do you work? And you were talking about not having a specific plan, something yeah. like that. Or sometimes I have a general plan, but yeah. once it comes on the canvas, you have yeah. to recognize it's not working. Yeah. And then what guides you is, does it serve the story yeah. or not? How can the story be better? <clears throat> how can it be clear? Mm. Yeah. Mm. I, I don't think it needs... I think it's okay to have a story that can be a bit ambiguous a little bit, that maybe you can take a couple of different interpretations but it has to be a clear thread a clear yeah. line to it it can't be so random that it's like well this because there's a gray pigeon it represents dignity or blah blah yeah. blah you know a lot of and these when it becomes yeah. um what's the word well when it becomes too symbolic symbolic yeah there are symbolic figures placed together like some kind of a, yeah. a, a puzzle yeah right? i want the everyday person that doesn't know anything about art to be able to see my painting and see the story and be gripped and enjoy it, mm. as well as someone who looks at paintings a lot and is cultured, you know. So I'm painting for the people, you know, not not like an elite. I don't think only 3% of the population should get my painting. I want everyone to be able to enjoy it. And then, you, well, that's where you go into doing something that is primal. Yes. It's, it's so wonderful with, with um, Blake Snyder, you have to make it, talking about screenwriting, yeah. uh, you have to make it so that a caveman and his brother can understand. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's great. You want someone to be able to relate to the yeah. painting that, yeah. that lives today, a thousand years in the past, a thousand years in the future. Exactly. You know? exactly. So that you paint these 
primordial human experiences yeah. that we all in- encounter at some point in our life, mm. you know, or we know someone that has went through that, you know. But you mentioned something, and I don't remember if I've seen your earlier work. But I mean, this is exceedingly uh, painterly. Yeah. I was going to say painful, but I remember <laughs> to say painterly. Um, it was painful, too. <laughs> <laughs> it shows. No, um, it's painterly. Uh, but you, you mentioned, I think, last night that you went from being very, very sort of tight. Yeah. Like, how do you make that transition? Because the people have... Well, I've I've met painters who are really focused on being tight, at least, who have a huge problem yeah. trying to become more painterly. So how did you do it? Honestly, I don't know what happened. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think the journey started whenever I, I first made a painting with a Pelly's palette, and it immediately harmonized. And I don't know, I just, I've always had a problem feeling like yeah, the the painting... It, it doesn't feel alive. It doesn't feel integrated. And mm. I, I just, I started playing with sandpaper a lot more. And then I started thinking about looking at late Rembrandt and Titian and like, why does that feel more alive than something that's just super rendered and, and has all the contours? And mm. why does it, I, also I want it, I want the, the painting to feel like maybe sometimes it's moved or it's moving or it's in the process of moving like there's there's action say something about that because that's fascinating yeah um so for instance the hand if it's here and it doesn't work you sand it out and you move it but maybe part of it is left like you've been actually been doing here right yeah you can see maybe it was here first and it changed um and you see Subtly pieces coming through, but it's not so clear, but in a way it you you feel almost like when you see someone you see that blur of it's it's moving It's in that, you know, yeah, yeah the and then it's stuck on your retina. I think if yeah. you don't do that it starts to feel like a, a Statue or like you're you're pasting something on top and it becomes very um, Superficial mm-hmm. in a way the paintings are stone. They're not breathing the, the so, figures, but you were more Clear lines, yeah. separate shapes, so to speak, uh, yeah. before, but uh, also I get, I presume, stronger colors. Yeah. Um, also, yeah, because I, I wasn't using the Pelly's palette. Yeah. Um, and then also I started to realize something that maybe the hand is more powerful if the arm's not painted as well as, as, as uh, intricate or as as uh, solid yeah. as yeah. the hand yeah. because then it, it tends to flatten things out because we don't actually see that way you know when i'm looking at you right now i see your nose your eyes but your hand is blurry i don't see that in in, in focus yeah. if i paint that that way then all of a sudden you look like a photograph and yeah. you look sort of fake in a way it flattens you out yeah, that's the weird thing that to have so-called photorealism as a standard which yeah. is not the way we perceive the world. That's the greatest insult. It sounds like, oh, that looks like a photo. You're painting. I'm like, I'm like okay. Well, that, that, that means you don't have the ability to, to, to uh, choose. Yeah. Or to, well, to, to uh, direct the focus to where it should be. But how, I mean, okay, so you don't really know exactly what triggered it. Um, but, okay, so, so from another... I think it was looking at painters that had a quality that I longed for but didn't yeah. know how to achieve it yeah you know like yeah because you have that that, that aspect of it's not that you don't have necessarily it's not necessarily so that you don't have the talent for it but you are until now not aware of it yeah yeah and and also i think also that i started working a little bit more from imagination not sticking exactly to what I see, mm. everything to make the painting, like how we were talking about the background and bringing those mm. colors in and then thinking, how do you integrate it? And it, some of that just kind of starts to evolve like organically. But that can be a fine line then. Is that where does it tip over to just uh, imagination? No, no. You, have, you, you have, have to have a balance. Yeah, yeah. So how do you try so, to achieve that? So maybe I have a, a general. Uh, something I'm looking at, but then I paint a session and and change it and mess it up, and then I bring it back, go back to nature, uh, and then I look at a book 
uh, look at you know an old master how they painted something and try to yeah. bring some of those uh, qualities. So it, it's just a big struggle. It's a big mess. It's you're sanding it, screwing it up, bringing it back, sanding it, screwing it up, bringing it back, using your rag, putting some oil on it, wiping it out. And eventually it's like, oh, okay, that looks okay now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, you know it. I know it. I, I showed you that self-portrait. And again, I'm not going to say to anyone how many years I've been <laughs> worked on that, but uh, I think I like totally destroyed it. I really sanded it down like four times. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, that, that's, uh, well, I guess we, we did talk a little about that. We did, when, when you, we did the school video where you showed the portrait, but this thing about when do you just keep yeah. pushing and when do you see that, well, I should actually change it or start, it, start yeah. a new one or. Yeah, and when you, know. you look at that school video yeah. and how rough it, yeah. that's how this started. Exactly. So, so then you're in a situation where you're, you're not the, um, the guy who can sort of show off, I got the glimpse in the eye in the first session, but yeah. you, you are really thinking like chess Long term. 15 uh, yeah. different draws in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but uh, so, okay. Uh, so, uh, the strive, it's about the struggle, yeah. you know. If you're not struggling, you're not improving, you're, you'll decline. Mm. So I always try to bite off a little bit more than I think I can chew. Painting. <laughs> <laughs> Including pieces of your throat. No, yeah. So, <clears> throat> that was too, uh, too, uh, uh, that was not a good image. But anyways, uh, it, other influences that throughout, yeah. I mean, from old masters, now that you mentioned it, then we need to get into, well, Brower is one thing we want to talk about, yeah, but yeah. there's some others too that yeah. you could uh, mention. Um, you know, uh, we have a, in Dallas, there's the Almond Carter Museum of American Art. And I went there and I saw some Remingtons in person, yeah. uh, the cowboy painter, and, and he oh. has sculptures and paintings. And although it's... He did sculptures too? Yeah. yeah. I have a book on that as well, like like the horses, they're really good. Um, but there was something that it just kind of... I felt like I recognized the characters in a way, even though they're from a different time period. Uh, something about that pioneer spirit, uh, you know, that, that sort of almost like crazy um, Dionysic kind of, you know, in Nietzsche's, uh, you know, that like intoxication. Um, it reminded me of some of my family members and my 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 own culture growing up, sort of a working class uh, Southern East Texan, um, and. I really respond to that, and and in the in the Adrian Brower, even though it's, it's sort of Dutch uh, genre, uh, there, he paints these um, these these peasants in the in the bars and the um, and there's there's a kind of also like this this energy, this sort of uh, Dionysic like in the moment um, uh, craziness um, that. It's it's very chaotic, and I like that. But also, I'm very sort of influenced by Rembrandt, who's more maybe in uh, like the the dream or the poet, you know, the the uh, Apollon uh, type uh, mm. idea of you know like really bringing that skill, bringing the the, the lighting, uh, and you know, honestly, my ultimate goal is if I could bring those two together, like a a Remington or a Brower with the the Rembrandt drama and lighting, and I think then maybe I, I could have something special. But um, but a little bit. I mean, since we we uh, promised you would yeah. to say a little bit more more about what are the qualities of of uh, well, Remington. But to, well, to start with Remington. Uh, yeah, Remington. Um, a lot of it too is uh, even though the colors are bright, he has a way to sort of put this atmosphere or dust in the in the the painting like like you know like these horses in the desert or someone being thrown off or shot and uh, in a way they feel like they're moving you know they they're it's not so clear and crisp it, it, it's, it's the action is there mm. in that one image um, so I respond a lot to that as well and then it's the ideal yeah. movement of yeah. action literally going on yeah 
Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, these primal things, you know, like a chase, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, being robbed or, or your horses being stole, you know, like these, these everyday kind of situations that they, they went through. Yeah, that, so. <clears throat> that's interesting that you, because I guess I don't know much about Remington, but uh, I guess he's a painter where that, that if you're really an, into modern art, you could, it's easy to ridicule because it's so dramatic and it's typical Western and all these things. Right? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I think it's important to not only look at the painters that reach the highest level, yeah. like Rembrandt. I think it's, it's good to be open to secondary influences in a way. You know, painters yeah. that there's maybe something there, but maybe you can learn something from that and do it better in a yeah. way. Because what you're describing is something that is primal. Yeah. 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 And to, to recognize, yeah. you know, you have to be open to, to, to seeing something, even if you don't like something about a painting. Is there something there? Is there something that you can take from that and add to your toolkit and become a better painter? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'll give you an example. Me growing up, um, before I went and uh, moved in with my father, uh, my mom, stepdad, and my brother and I, we lived really deep in the country. Like, uh, we actually, my brother and my room was like in this ladder. We had to go up a barn. Yeah, like a regular barn, no yeah. insulation. Yeah. And then the shower was outside. Yeah. And, and we had gardens, and it was like, it was in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it was a lot of good times, it was fun. Um, and one time, just to give you an example of like some of the everyday things that maybe some people would see as outrageous, uh, <laughs> similar to in like, like a Brower or a Remington, my brother and I, we went and we, uh, we saw this armadillo hole and we caught it. We, at the time, mind you, I was in the first grade, so I was probably five years old. Mm -hmm. And my brother was just a couple of few years older than me. And we carried this armadillo home. And my stepdad, he, he grabbed it and he started to skin it out. Like, uh, and we were going to eat it. Uh, and, you know, I was, you know, a young boy. I was just sitting, I was like, I guess my adrenaline was pumping. I was like, cut his heart out, cut his heart out. <laughs> and, and, and he wanted to shut me up, so he did it. And then he said, now pull your hand. And I was like, no. And he's like, yes, and hold it. And he, he put it in my hand, and I looked at it, and I remember feeling like very tragic for a moment, like, like really, <laughs> like, what the heck did I just do? <laughs> you know. Uh, but that passed quickly. And then I, the next thing I remember, you know, my brother and I were chasing my mom around the house with a bloody hand. <laughs> <laughs> and and then we had some armadillo stew that night. Um, so a lot of people would be totally. Comment, yeah. They were like, "That's yeah. traumatic. You need to go to the psychologist." And, <laughs> you know, but that was like an everyday occurrence. It was just yeah. everyday life. So, so so I think in a way I react to those paintings uh, in a nostalgia. You know. Yeah, I, I, th that fascinates me. That that there is that connection. You should always always um, find out what you're attracted to somehow or what, what you yeah what you've experienced yeah and and you do something that is similar i mean i know yeah uh, in john constable's case uh, i think all his most famous works uh, they f you find the motifs like 300 yards uh, in a diameter around this house right so, yeah or ra radius around this yeah. house yeah yeah yeah, you know, I think it's good to, to bring from your own experiences and then find a way to make them universal or mm. eternal, mm. timeless, you know. Mm. So you, you may paint a story that's related to your experience, but it's not your exact story and it's not important exactly. that it happened to you. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's a major, major point. Yeah. But uh, in Brower's case, I mean, I, I knew about him, but I didn't, hadn't looked at him that much. Yeah. So I'm really convinced by your idea that, that you can learn things from painters who are not the top of the tops. Yeah. So, but, but what's... Yeah, uh, I, I came upon him for, by accident. And what? then I, yeah. I, I came by him, upon him by accident yeah. looking at Dutch uh, um, genre paintings. And I instantly was like, okay, I need to order a book. I just, you know, ordered a book and I started looking. Through, I was like, wow, mm. there's, there's so much I can take here you know, in his best paintings, right? Yes. Um, I think 
what he has that sometimes painters like Franz Hall don't is um, all the characters aren't just acting stupid in the bar. There's yeah. there's some kind of tension. There's there's a so you know they're acting silly, but there's a little bit of melancholy there as well. For sure. And, and then you have some kind of bite in the painting. Yeah. Just as like if you're gonna paint a uh, a tragic painting, you don't want it to just be all sad. Though. You know there has yeah. to be a glimpse of hope. You know. So, yeah. You know, some, different... some kind of duality there. Yeah. Because if you compare compare Brouwer to, um, for example, I looked at Peter de Hoch, I think it's H O O C H. Hmm. Um, you get that typical what what you think of when you think of uh, genre paintings. Yeah, chess floors and um, everything's perfect, and you see all the window sills and the, the, the yeah. curtains. Everything's perfectly draped, um, and technically speaking, in terms of how the color works, you get that problem that these different things are equally valid. You, they they can p compete with each other. There's not a specific focus, although it's wonderfully painted. Yeah. But but they don't they spread out in all kinds of directions. And also, compared to Brouwer, you see that there's one thing going on, more or less. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a cat in the corner. So, but yeah. it's, it's sort of more But added. there's a hierarchy. There's a, there's a focus. No, no, but in, in Hoch's paintings, you don't have that yeah. hierarchy as in Brouwer's painting. Yeah, if, if that was exactly. Your, okay, that was your point. Yeah. yeah. Because in, in, uh, in yeah, Hoch's paintings, the, the attention is spread all over. And there's there's one specific action going on, or just sitting there, and, and nothing, nothing is going on. Yeah, and that's sort of the action. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it's like, why am I looking at this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and when you go back to Brouwer, then he is much more. You see how close, uh -huh. how, how much closer he is to Rembrandt. Yeah, yeah. interesting that, fact uh, I was reading, which surprised me, is that Rembrandt owned at least six of his paintings and several of his drawings, and Rubens owned. At least 17 of his paintings. No wonder. So those guys were also looking at painters and what can they bring to their work. Yeah. If you compare some, like uh, I think Brower's uh, flute player, I don't know if that's the exact name, but um, uh, I show, showed you that the other day, the expression yeah. next to some of Rembrandt's early self-portraits, you can yeah, see, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this one specific one where that self-portrait where it's like yeah, uh, like that. It was smoking, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then yeah. there's the figure next to him, which is actually the head is is m m much better painted, uh -huh. and that is really amazingly well painted. Yeah. That's. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. important. Not yeah. you know, if you yeah. just write stuff off because it's not the highest level, yeah, you'll yeah. miss little things like that. Yeah, that, I think you know. That's a major gems you can find. That's a major takeaway from you appearing here and, and talking about this. Yeah, definitely. But at the end here, tell us something about what you're learning now. Oh, so much, and yeah. it's hard to put into words, yeah. but I, I feel like uh, every day I, I learn something, something new. Um, for one, I was, I was completely blown away to see Odd Nerdrum's paintings in person because just from the books and my assumptions, I just I felt like that they were super painted thick everywhere, you know, like mm. very that like thick uh, layers of yeah, paint. And, but yeah. uh, there are thick areas, but there's a lot of areas that are very translucent, and you can see the layers and the colors, mm. and and uh, it's a good sort of combination of that. And that that goes to show you that rough painting doesn't necessarily mean thick painting. Yeah, and uh, I think. Just seeing that has already changed the way I start paintings, and, and I'm starting to see that there's there's more possibilities here with mm. that. But also, uh, we talk about philosophy a lot. Like every morning, we have a, a morning meeting, and we may talk about painters or paintings, and we'll have them on the floor and compare. And like, why is this one more compelling than than this other painting? What what's working here and what's not? Mm. And and you know, we discuss it. And also just everyday sort of philosophical ideas. And, and the point is to, to, to use your brain to, to analyze things from different angles and um, sort of to help you dig deeper in your own painting, you know. To, yeah. uh, uh, do you have any bullet points on what um, kind of painters are 
generally than described as better painters and like what well, what Rubens versus Rembrandt or yeah. or Titian, you know, um, Sargent, you know, we talk about how Sargent's paintings they're beautifully done, they're they're really quick and and very you know impasto and like, mm. psh, but it's sort of opaque in a way, opaque mm. um, and not. Not physically, but like uh, on the the story, you know. The, the well, idea I guess that's what, when you and I have to say I've I've seen some sergeants in uh, at the free collection in New York. Yeah. Um, but then, but mostly in books. But I think I guess the problem is that when you sort of get the idea that the painting is on top of the canvas. Yeah. If you know, I mean, yeah. of course, the painting paint is on top of the canvas, but but it seems to be lying on top of it instead of it, that of sanding it down or, mm -hmm. or working with it. So you get that sort of layer of air between yeah. the canvas and the figure. Yeah. In there. Yeah, and um, also like with Rembrandt, like the Prodigal Son, mm. you know, you see that and you forget that you're looking at a painting. You 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 become part of the story yeah. because it's painted so well. Um, yeah, I, I think. Nerdum talked about, about once um, how, in that case, the Bible illustrates the painting instead of the yes. opposite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whenever the painting's the illustration, that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. Whenever yeah. the the story becomes yeah. the illustration for the painting, then you know you've done something special. Yeah, because I th I think, yeah, it's always a problem if you look at the figure doing something and it's a model being painted. Yeah. You see, uh, you, well, one of those. I mean, of course, Titian in, in the um, done wonderful things, but but uh, you have this and other painters of Christ standing on a cloud, and you see very well if the that person is just standing on a, some kind of a scaffolding or something yeah. like that, uh, or some some boards, and not on a cloud, right? It's yeah. you see it very very clearly. Yeah, and you know what else has been very uh, motivational and inspiring is to to see him work. And mm. he'll let you come in and watch him paint and have a conversation and to watch someone that is as um, accomplished and as great of a painter as he is that he still struggles with his painting. It's mm. not a just, you know, everything's perfect. It all goes to hell for him too and he finds a way to, to bring it in. He just does it much better than me. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's very inspiring. You know, it shows you that, you know, you're on a good path and maybe perhaps if you work hard your whole life, maybe you can achieve something like that. Yeah. That's a perfect way to end. Yeah. Oh. So, Sean Roberts, thank you for coming to the Cave of Palace. It was my pleasure. And, as usual, I would like to thank our other top sponsors as well. Dean Anthony, Anders Berge Christensen, Eric Lasky, Herman Borge, Fernando Ramirez, Iver Ukesta. Jon Harald Aspheim, Jack Ens Warner, Jared Fountain, Marion B. Pedersen, Maurice Robbins, Misty Delane, Michael Irish, Richard Barrett, Stacy Evangelista, Trim Jordal, and Ingve Hellam. And remember, head over to kopolis.com slash subscribe, become a member and access all our videos there. I'll see you next month. <laughs>